Paul Jensen was living the American dream, or so he thought. He had a lucrative business career, a beautiful wife, healthy kids, and an exceptionally strong body and mind. From all outward appearances, he had it made. But the dream was shattered the day his life went over the edge in Joshua Tree National Park. Paul joins us to share the shocking circumstances that led up to a 45-foot fall, miraculous recovery, and amazing journey of self-discovery that followed. We're so thrilled to have you on the Harvest Show. I was just talking with uh, my co-host earlier about my lack of sleep in the bags under my eyes. <laughs> so Chuck gets to hear, you know, hear my little complaining and whining before I go on the air when I've read a really good book the night before. I can understand well, after having looked at this book, though, and uh, what, what an amazing story it is. Well, thank you. Thank you know, you. Uh, I'd like for you to kind of start a little bit in the beginning mm -hmm. and then kind of lead us up to this, this point where you, where you actually fail. Because what I was amazed with part of your story, mm -hmm. at the age of five, you had literally read through the Bible. You mm -hmm. were literally reading through the Bible. I, I was. I was, uh, I was very much in the Christian church and in my Christian walk as a kid. In fact, I felt called to be a missionary by the time I was uh, 12 years old. Um, it was a... It was, it, was, it was a unique experience in my life, and I really felt called to, to serve God. And, and then through a series of moves and peer pressure and strange things, I eventually uh, kind of drifted slowly, one bad step after another bad step, starting around high school or around my senior year in high school. And then my competitive nature just took over, and then I just pretty much departed from what I knew. In you fact, know, what's, what's interesting, part of your story, kind of a, a little warning to parents out there, you were this good Christian guy in a good mm -hmm. Christian environment, mm -hmm. and your parents moved, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, during that, that, that teenage years, you were kind of thrown out. In yes. fact, you says that you began to wander into the labyrinth of the world with mm -hmm. all of its lies and deceits, mm -hmm. and so you had that pivotal point where all the protective hedges you had had around mm -hmm. you as a young man really weren't there anymore. That is very true. And as I, as I made that walk away from God, it was amazing how um, I was rewarded in the worldly sense. And uh, I believe I was you know, being brought away from God in that, in that respect. And um, I really did go full steam into, uh, into the fraternity guy going wild, I guess you could call me. And, and for more than a decade, uh, I, was, I was really immersed in the world where uh, TV and music and, and movies uh, defined who I was. And the culture of society eventually shaped what I was trying to be. Let me interject something, then I'm going to let you get a question in, Chuck. Because I wanted to set the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, because sometimes we can generally talk about, well, the culture shaped me and mm -hmm. then move on. And, mm -hmm. But, but it, it kind of lays the foundation yes. of, of some real warfare that came at you. Because you listened and you were intensely involved with the, the, the group, The Doors. Mm -hmm. and, and, had, and, uh, and their music is very dark. In mm -hmm. fact, I, I believe that... Uh, you know, there was Satanism there and everything. But at one point in your college experience, you literally have a manifestation of evil manifest in your room. Yes. And so share a little bit of that story. And then what began the turning to God? And then I'll let you take over, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you, my music tastes were the Doors, Pink Floyd, uh, you name it. I, I really liked it. And I, I wasn't purposely walking towards an evil path. I was just kind of walking towards my own path. I was, I, was, well, I was trying to shape God in term, into context of what I wanted him to be, rather me trying to shape my life to what God wants me to be. And so uh, when I finally met my wife, or my to-be to be wife, uh, got engaged, and I, I started to realize the life I had been living was wrong, um, I started to, to retrench and go back and kind of try to drift back towards God. And right then, um, yes, I, I did feel a very evil presence in my room. That kind of it was the first realization that I had that there really was a spiritual battle going on in this world, and, and that um, this do I, am I a good Christian boy or am I over here, you know, pursuing worldly influences? There is a spiritual battle playing, tugging me both sides. That at that point, I became very much aware of it, which manifests itself more than a decade and a half later at uh, Joshua Tree. As you, uh, as you went through that battle, mm -hmm. ironically enough, three weeks before this incident at Joshua Tree, mm -hmm. you decided to get actively back into your religious life and actively back into the church. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Joshua Tree. What happened that day? Joshua Tree, uh, we were vacationing in Palm Springs. This was in 2002. And I, I always, like there was a kid, I was in, uh, grew up in Southern California. So I got my, my wife, my seven and, uh, and four-year-old uh, children, my sister, her husband, and their two kids. And I rallied them up, and we went to Joshua Tree National Park. And, and we were walking the desert floor. I don't know if you've been there, but it's a very stark desert landscape with big piles of boulders kind of separated, you know, apart. And I took my son to go boulder up. Um, we went about 75 feet up while everybody else stayed on the desert floor. 
and uh, subsequently I, I was up on a, a very flat platform. Um, I smashed my knee on a rock. I, uh, I called for my brother-in-law to say, hey, come up here, help me get my son down because I wasn't feeling well. I walked clearly away from the edge. Uh, I put my hands on my knees and faced the ground really close because I thought I might pass out, and I did pass out. But when I passed out, uh, my wife and my sister from the desert floor, 75 feet below, said they saw a rag doll just tossed off the cliff where they saw me do a dead somersault and they saw me land hard um, 30 feet up from the desert floor, essentially four and a half stories. Uh, when they ran up to me, they thought that they'd find me dead. And what they did, they found me uh, essentially kind of face first. This side, ironically, the side that right here, this skull right here, you could see about this much of my skull it was just butterfly open. Uh, my left eye was actually kind of kind of looking inside out. Kind wow. Of. Um, you oh, got the pictures the up pictures. on screen, yes. Uh, there's the rock, there's the boulder where I fell from. And uh, if you can see, there's day one and certainly day three after the miracle, you can see really what I look like. You can see the deep impact that was really butterfly open. Um, my arm was so far behind my body, my right arm, that my wife thought I didn't have an arm. So she reached, so she grabbed me to see, do I have an arm and am I alive? And she picked me up, she realized I, she heard me breathing and I had an arm. And uh, my brother-in-law takes off to go get a bunch of, to get help. Runs into a, a trauma surgeon getting trained by uh, an EMT, how to rock climb. Wow. So they come to help me. Eventually, of the 50 people that came to help me, 35 are medically trained. And that was within the area where you're climbing. Joshua, right. Which is completely remote. I don't know yeah. if you've ever been there, but it's so remote. There are plenty of people praying, and it was a, it was a tremendous experience. And I laid on that rock, and I felt my life slipping away, but I felt a tremendous peace. And uh, meanwhile, the, uh, the rescue workers are telling my wife, hey, be prepared. Uh, he, uh, he probably suffered brain damage. Uh, he most likely has paralysis. Uh, broken bones are certainly uh, probably in his, in his world. Uh, internal injuries, he could be bleeding internally. He may be dying soon. Um, but we see in those pictures it says day one after miracle, day three after miracle. Yes. And the miracle is none of that happened. None of that happened. I, 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 took a, I got my first helicopter ride to uh, Palm Springs. Uh, they treated me like a full trauma patient, CAT scan my entire body, x-rayed my entire body, and uh, they ended up calling me Miracle Boy. They, they, they said I had no internal injuries, I had no broken bones, my skull was not fractured, and if you could see, my, that, it was amazing it wasn't fractured. In fact, my brain waves didn't even represent trauma. Um, I had fallen four and a half stories and onto my head and essentially just walked away with essentially surface level scratches and a back concussion. You know, there's a, a lot more to your story. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have part two. We'll be right back with more from Paul Jensen and part two of The Miracle Man.